Welcome to this episode of Barrels and Business, guys. I am your host, Jay Green. As always, my role here is to bring you an entertaining hour or so, depending on the surf. And there's, <laughs> there's no surf out there today, so we could be here for a while, right? Fine by um, me. Fine by you. This hour or so is about bringing you tangible tips on how to build your business, but also all things surf industry and, you know, how we can get amongst it and start frothing. My guest today is none other than the owner and publisher of Surfing Life magazine. You might have guessed that by the shirt he's rocking and all the stuff in the background. Yeah. (laughs) So, Ray, I, I don't pronounce your last name correctly. Give us your last name, mate. Just Bishop. Just Bishop. Just yep. straight out Bishop. I That's was like, it. Stop. you know, I'm a bit lisdexic at the best of times. So you, if I'm writing something, I'm just like, just if it looks like a word, roll with it. If I say the word wrong, I'm blonde, just deal with it. Probably, <laughs> better, pre- probably better after a beer or two. Speaking of which, we talked about having a beer. Have you got one? What's your beer of choice? Cheers. Clank. <laughs> oh, I've got some your mates, Larry at the moment. Good stuff. Guys from the sunny coast. Yeah, good little microbrewery up there doing a great job. Love it. I, uh, I'm always into the burly big heads because I don't drink sugar or preservatives. Sugar and perver- preservative free beer. Yeah, I don't mind the big head. So cheers. Cheers. Well, awesome. As I mentioned, you are the owner and publisher of Surfing Life. And we're going to delve into how that happened and how you made your dream a reality. But because I think it was like you wanted to work there for like 30 years or something. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. About, you're like, mm, about that. How many? <laughs> <laughs> if I say that, I give my age away. But I think the wrinkles do that anyway. So whatever. <laughs> we'll put the Zoom, the Zoom blur filter on, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you've been surfing for about 35 years. You're a graphic designer at heart. You're trying to master the art of living. Is that right? No. No? No, I'm already a master of the art of living. Oh, <laughs> you've nailed it. <laughs> Got it dialed in. Yeah, Got it yeah. Sorted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jack, it, yeah it's um, Lawrence Jacks or Lawrence Purcell Jacks. Is, he's got a quote about the being the master of the art of living. And I'm, I read it and I'm like, hey, doll. I said to my missus, hey, this is exactly us. So, you know, people are like, oh, how can I do what you're doing and, live the way you live. And I'm like, uh, just do it. I love it. I love it. So tell us about just do it then. How did you just do it? How did you just make your dream a reality? It, that's a tricky one because um, uh, all dreams based on reality or all dreams turning into reality to me is just following your passion wherever it leads you. It may not necessarily be uh, when you think it's going to happen. For instance, for me, I wished it was 30 years ago but the reality of it is I might have worked for Surfing Life 30 years ago but then would have I owned it so yeah well that's I say everything happens for a reason right we're cause for everything that happens and it probably your earlier entrepreneurial pursuits would have led you to being able to handle something of this standard really yeah, more. I think exactly what you said is correct there. Everything you do leading up to where you're at um, gives you those that ability to do what you what you really want to do. Um, so I just, you know, I just set about making sure that I did everything I could to the best of my ability, and um, from there, things just happen. The harder I get, harder I work, the luckier I get. Funny that, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of is, yeah. Yeah. So there is an age old saying, like you create your own luck. Uh, there's, there's no such thing as luck. It's really about you designing that and taking action and being open to it. And I always talk about I'm a powerful manifester. I'm a super powerful manifester, but I don't just sit on my ass waiting for something to fall on, in my lap. It's manifestation is taking action. So having the dream, having the forethought and the steps you're going to take to make that a reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the people that go, oh, yes, I, I really want this to happen, um, but don't get out and just do everything they can 
to make it happen generally means that when it does happen, because it often does, they're actually not ready. They don't have the skill set. They can't do all of the back end stuff that they need to do, and they don't have that ability to um, uh, push through the hard times when you know they've got their dream, and then it gets tough, and they're not ready. Whereas if you're just going hard at it before you have your dream, then when your dream comes and it gets tough, you're good to go. I yeah, think that- you can. I, I am half Dutch, so if I speak double Dutch, people need to. <laughs> uh, I did, someone did tell me that you were a little bit Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who that was. Uh, oh, nobody that you would know. <laughs> Luke. <laughs> I think she's a little uh, bit Dutch too. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I want to just walk through, though, your earlier uh pursuits as an entrepreneur so tell me where did your business owning pursuits start and what what were the things that you learned back there or even better what were the fuck ups that you had that really prepared you for owning your dream oh well i spent a lot of time in agency land before i had my first business i was probably there for uh, working in advertising agencies for maybe six, seven years. Um, and then I started my first design studio um, with enough clients to get me going. I'd done such a good job at the last place I was at, I was still getting contract work for them as well. So um, that's what I always say to people. If you have a dream job you want to do, sometimes you've got to work two jobs at once. It might be not what you want to do and what you want to do, what you do want to do, but you're doing both at the same time till you can actually uh, get the finances behind it because uh, as much as I love passion, it doesn't pay the mortgage. Um, I say the world doesn't rub on love, trust and pixie dust. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But sometimes you can get some money for love, trust and pixie dust. <laughs> um, but I think the, the biggest thing I learned in my first business was uh, pay the tax man. Oh, that's <laughs> well, that's the problem with creatives is because we're all too <laughs> focused on being creative and the whole uh, back end logistics side of stuff. We're like, ah, eh, that's just, I'll get to Later it. I'll problems. To it. Yeah. Yeah. And the funny thing is the ATO let you push things off, push things off. And then next minute is this massive debt. So um, I think, I think the, biggest thing I learned is uh, there's no such thing as perfect. Um, so if you're getting it wrong, pfft, who cares? You, as long as you learn from the getting it wrong, then the getting it wrong was a good thing. So there's uh, no bad things. I had my last um, podcast actually dropped today uh, with Brent Valley, uh, who's got Bell Surf Wax. We had a big conversation about making sure you make the mistakes and it's the learnings and creating um, businesses that allow the the staff to be vulnerable because if you allow vulnerability, people can fuck up and then it's it's the learnings that you get from that that, that really push businesses forward, push people forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with the concept of a mistake anyway. There's either learning or not learning. There's kind of, that's the, the only two things that are there. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And I think when it, when it comes to it, the only time it is a mistake is if you don't make if you don't pay attention to the lesson. Yeah, if you do it twice. Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. Just, yeah, that's that's the once <laughs> once bitten twice shy. <laughs> Cliche. Uh, yeah. So tell me then, what were what were the steps to owning surfing life? Uh, it's an interesting one. I I was a, a creative director in an agency on the Gold Coast, so. I was kind of at the top of my game in that sense. It's like good job, car, phone, whatever. Pretty cushy. Running a team. Yeah, it was pretty cushy. Um, But I was kind of over doing marketing campaigns for bidets and childcare centers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, every now and then you you will get a shitty job. But they would have been hot property at the beginning of COVID when there was like no toilet paper to be found. Listen, I don't care how much money you can make off of whatever because uh, to me it's not about uh, money, it's about job satisfaction. Otherwise, um, 
You weren't satisfied having people's bums clean? No? <laughs> you just had a visual, creative person, just visual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I went looking, I went hunting for something else. Um, and then this little Facebook ad popped up with the opportunity to, um, uh, come on as business manager for surfing life. So like, sounds fun. That's what I've been wanting to do for 30 years. Um, it was kind of a shift, uh, away from creative director to business manager. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Sounds good. It's in a field that I love. So um, and managing businesses, piece of cake. Um, so over a three-month interview process of many uh, uh, espresso, beer, surf, Saturday morning surf, <laughs> we just kept backwards and forwards with the current owner at the time. And in the end, he just said, listen, Ray, I can't offer you the job. I'm like, okay, no worries. And he said, but I can offer you the business. And I said, did <laughs> I don't like to make decisions without consulting my better half um, because she is my partner in everything, life, business, kids, house, everything. Wife, and um, what's that? Happy, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just I care about her. So therefore I care about her, um, her opinion. So I rang her and it's funny because I used to be the boots and all. I mean, I am still a boots and all kind of guy, but I was always the, let's go do it, you know. But this time I was like, oh, what do you think? You know, and she's like, let's do it. I'm like, all right, we're on. So, yeah, within, I don't know, a month of that, then we were, we'd fired up Surfing Life as the new publishers. Wow. And how long ago was that? Over three years. Amazing. Yeah. Now I hear there's some, some big news. I had a, I asked a couple of people on Facebook if I had any questions that I should ask you today. And Salty Surfer Girl asked, are magazines still a thing, basically? And where are they going? So what do you reckon? Are magazines still a thing? Uh, if they're not, I'm not. So I guess <laughs> that's the first answer. It's kind of a weird, it is a weird question for Salty Surfer Girl. No offense, Salty, um, <laughs> that you knew that she knew that I was coming on the publisher of a magazine to ask if it was still a thing. But anyway. Uh, uh, is anyone still buying magazines was the exact question. <laughs> exact question, yeah. And again, it obviously, it, I think it's a self-answering question. Um, but I, I, I feel the point she was getting at is what's their popularity? Are they, you know, are they viable anymore? Um, and the reality is, and me sitting in front of you is 100% viable and and they are being purchased. Um, I don't know whether you know the worldwide media organization called Reuters, um, but it, you do know. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so, I do. I used to recruit for them. Oh, back there you go. Yeah, yeah. Back, back in the day. day. Um, so Reuters, as you know, they're massive. So end of last year, they did a um, pretty exhaustive survey into print. Obviously, uh, it's one of the things they're interested in and invested in. Not the only thing because they're in TV and they're online and they're everywhere. Um, but they, their study found that, um, I mean, it was entitled, if millennials killed print, will Gen Z revive it? Um, and their statistics were showing that um, Gen Z were uh, reading up to an hour of magazines a week. So that's, a pretty not up to actually they were reading an hour of magazines a week they prefer to um study from a textbook they hate studying online uh they would prefer to read a novel like a printed novel as opposed to a kindle or whatever and they read an hour of magazines a week so i, I think i think there was a time where magazines struggled and magazines only struggled not because of the quality of the product they were producing but they were definitely um, in competition for um, eyeballs and ad spend. Uh, when social media came along, I mean, what is it? Is it even 10 years now? Like it's not long. It's very short. And we're already starting to see a decline in that. So that's just something else for you. But um, when they came along, it, there was a lot of pressure put on it. But the reality of it is it's, it's not about whether – there's pressure put on it or not. It's about whether you can think creatively in that space to make it viable. This is getting long winded, but I'm going to keep going. Um, 
I believe in the surf industry space, um, viability is something that's even tougher um, in that niche. So we're a niche within a niche. So surf industry is a niche, surfing, and surf media is a niche within that niche. Now, the issue, I believe, came when um, uh, big business saw that you could make money from surfing. And that was because uh, the population, you know, we, we know about pop culture and, and uh, popular fashion. So all the f- people out there went, oh, surfing is so cool. Let's go. Let's, I want to look like a surfer. They didn't get it and it was unattainable. And then anything that's unattainable and they don't understand, they want because it's cool. So then the big brands got it out to, I mean, you could go, I remember driving out West from like through Roma or something like that. And there was a surf store there. And I'm like, what? (laughs) And then you see old guys on golf courses wearing billabongs and you're like, "Ah." so aspirational goals there. There's some, (laughs) yeah. When they were starting to produce size 42 board shorts, then you knew that it was missing the mark. Um, So that's what happened to the surf industry as an, and that's the bubble that burst um, and surf media was part of that, but they just needed to understand that there's a, there was a shift need to happen to some creative thinking and to draw it back from making money back to where it all started from, which was making a living. Surf industry started on making a living, not on making money. So the guys like Doug Claw Warwick from Rip Curl and Brian Singer and then Gary Green from um, Quicksilver and Gordon Merchant from uh, Billabong. That's all they wanted to do. They just went, I don't want to work in an office job. I want to work where you are at the beach there. And I want to have a job that I can satisfy my surf cravings and maybe even work within the surf industry because I'm so passionate about it. No, well, they, my life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, they actually didn't want to work in the surf industry because there was no such thing. They invented the surf Creative. industry. Correct. And, but that was just for lifestyle and living. And then next minute through the nineties and noughties, you know, capital investment came in and they were making millions and then they were making billions and everyone went, wow, look at this. And then the cool left surfing and it all popped. So sorry for the long winded. <laughs> all right, I love it. Well, it's funny because uh, when I was doing my research for the day, I was like, I really should get a magazine. I actually stole this off an, an 11 year old. Um, and it's a good issue, that one. Well, it's a great issue. And uh, there's actually a couple of really good stories I'm going to drag out of you uh, in a minute. But what that said to me is every time the issue comes out, he's getting it. Um, so that's telling us kids are loving it, kids want it. Oh, yeah. I, when I sat down to have my um, paleo granola this morning, I don't want to be scrolling on my phone or looking at another, like, I think my team's going to drop a picture of the behind the scenes of both of our studios at the moment and the amount of lights that I'm looking into. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is look at another fucking screen. Oh my goodness. Um, I love to thumb through something. If I'm flying, having something to thumb through. I The, the latest book I just bought, funny enough, is the Rip Curl story. So it's the hardcover book. Great book. Because... My, my aspirational goals is to lay outside on my actual beach and actually go outside. Um, yeah, but you don't want to be laying there with the iPad and the sun reflecting off it. Like you want the, the, the tangible. Um, so I think, yeah. that, I think that that really answers that question. I think there is a revival and, and more and more people are starting to want to distance themselves from the tech. And I think, actually, this is a question for you. Have, how many episodes, how many issues have you had come out during COVID? We haven't stopped. So, so um, how many is that for me though? How many? Uh, three. Three. Yeah. So have, we, we're going from five issues to six issues next year, which gives us bi-monthly. Um, awesome. This year we did five. We did one before uh, COVID and we've done the three since and we're about to have another one. Yeah. Um, I'm other- wondering if there's any, any data spikes in purchasing due to COVID because so many more people have been stuck on screens whether they're wanting to retreat to the 
to the real thing. Yeah. Well, that was one of the, the things that the study found is that um, the Gen Z, because so millennials, they invented social media. So they're like, it's the thing. And they all heralded, heralded the death of print and without any statistical whatever, because if, if print's dead, why are we still going? But, um, and go into a news agency, you can still buy a hundred different copies of a hundred different mm-hmm. um, titles. Um, but that was the other thing because Gen, Gen Z were born into it. So they already know that social media and screen time and all of that. And they're the ones going, oh yeah, I need some downtime from my screens. Okay. So they're already well-educated um, into the fact that they need to um, yeah, get off their uh, yeah. devices and get onto some printing. It's like, it's tactile. It's um, the way the mind maps its way through a novel compared to a Kindle. You know, it's like, and you, 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 you've read for, a, you know, maybe an hour or two because you're relaxing on a sad day, like just a novel or whatever. And, and you put your bookmark in and you go, oh, I can see how far I've got through. Yeah, the progress is the progress yeah. bar. <laughs> Co- it, correct. And it's, and it's something that's way more tangible because you can feel it and you can, the, the tactile response from it, um, neuroscience ha- goes b- deeply into the fact that um, print is actually relaxing, whereas digital is not relaxing. So you've got... Um, it's got so many, it's got so many benefits print does. Yeah. So um, I think I owe it to, I'm one of the people anyway, that owe it to mankind, human nature to um, keep it going just so they don't lose a whole bunch of rubbish. So well, the, the funny thing is I went on a war against paper when I had my recruitment firm. So probably, oh God, now too many years ago, nine years ago maybe more. And I, we had a printer, but I'd always keep the ink cartridge out so no one could print. We obviously doing recruitment, we're always um, having resumes and stuff. So I gave everyone an iPad and a stylus and they had to get the, the resume online, not allowed to print it. We wrote, hand wrote our notes digitally so that we didn't have paper. So I was trying to move myself over to reading my books electronically, reading, consuming all my stuff and, and not buying them. And I just found that I had a severe decline in reading. <laughs> uh, absolutely. A good thing to remember, though, is I remember reading, uh, I can't remember where I read it, but the, it was a guy who was doing a TED Talk and he was saying that every book you purchase, every novel you purchase will outlive you. Yeah. And they don't know. Do you ever throw a book out? No. And I, I was literally telling this story the other day. So my first novel that I read during school, um, like, because I was trying to avoid studying and I figured if dad saw me reading a book, then he would just think I was studying. So someone had given me this book called Wizard's First Rule. And I had, I loved it so much because it was the thing that got me into reading. And I lent it to the ex-boyfriend, like the boyfriend at the time, and it, and it had gone, the book had gone. And but four or five years later, I was working in a bar in Darwin and someone sat down at the bar and they had that book and I'd never, ever seen anyone else with the book. I'm like, oh my God, that's my favorite book. Oh, can I touch it? It was my fucking book. <laughs> my, like I'd written in the front of it and it got, it, I lent it to a dude in Ballina and now it's in a bar in Darwin. Yeah. It's such a gift to give, though, isn't it? Re gift. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you can lend it, and it, you know you don't. You can be on a plane, and your battery's not going to go flat, and you. Uh, you, you can be in the mental eyes, and you've got no service. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> uh, I, I actually read. Um, have you read Operation Playboy? No, I saw that. I do want to uh, get my hands on that one. So yeah, get your hands book. on it. Mm. I've lent that to a few people. Mm. Um, I burnt through that while I was uh, in, in the mental eyes last year. Wow. What year are we? Last year? <laughs> yeah. Would have been last year. I, yeah. I went for my birthday last year. Um, and I was like, oh, I wish I took more books. I thought it'd take me longer. Uh, yeah. was it 10 days. Uh, I should have stocked up. <laughs> I, I did that when I went to the Maldives. I took Chaz Smith's Cocaine and Surfing. And finished it on the plane. Oh, <laughs> so is that then when good? It, 
I, I think it's yeah. You should read it. It's a. I think it's a. He draws lo, a long bow between KK and Surfing. I don't think it's. I think it's a bit tenuous the link. But it's. Yeah. He's such a good writer. So, yeah, it's worth reading. I think his other book, um, Welcome to Paradise Now Go to Hell, is better. Okay, um, I'm going to get on that. But there's so I can give you a massive list of quality. Team, books. team, if you're listening, can you put the put the, <laughs> the book names into the chat so that we can grab them after the yeah. afterwards and link it. Oh, gee. Um, I, if you want pure surf um, writing, I think Bob Bob McTavish stoked is oh, yeah? amazing. Yeah, what his life in surfing is just all time. Like, oh, awesome. Um, stowing away on the Osanova to Hawaii, like literally stowing away, gets to Hawaii, gets through customs, doesn't have a passport, doesn't have anything, doesn't have a red <laughs> cent to his name, uh, ends up surfing to Hawaii for a month until customs guys bust him and ship him back to Australia. I love it. Well, back in those days, my dad was a, um, was a merchant um, sailor before becoming a mercenary. Um, and he, he's like, the places they went with no, there was no passports and you just pulled up a dock. Yep. And if you got caught doing something you shouldn't, they just chucked you on the next ship and sent you home. Uh, yep. Yep. I, no, so uh, that, I think that's probably one of the best books I've read of late. And although Sean Doherty's latest book, Golden Days, is is yep. uh, been a really good read too. I'm halfway oh. through it. So I'm, I picked up, um, someone told me when I was on my, um, my trip, they saw me reading Operation Playboy and they told me to get Barbarian Days. Oh, amazing book. I can't. It's like. It's, Have you started it? I started it. <laughs> so I gave it to dad and he's like, oh, I just pick up and read one story here and there and then I have to have a beer and a joint. And then, but <laughs> it's, just a, it's like a, he said he's an amazing, amazing literary and he's writing. Yeah, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Yeah, his writing is amazing, but I, I don't know. I don't know why I couldn't get into it. Do you do you like Bali? Well, I've uh, I teach a business accelerator in Bali, so I've been there about eight, eight, nine, eight times in the last All right. few weeks, until we got shut down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Phil Jarrett, um, he wrote a book called Bali Heaven and Hell. That's a really good history of Bali through to the surfing and to the bombings and everything. That's a really oh, good really. Book. What was the yeah. name again? Um, Bali Heaven and Hell. Now, Bali, heaven and just hell. by the way, for the your listeners, for the people watching. Uh, you can get most of these books on our website. We actually, oh, really? yeah, we've got a bookshop with Life of Brian, Bali Heaven and Hell, ah. The Rip Curl Story. Yeah, all That's- of Tim Baker's books, all of Phil Jarrett's books. Okay, um, what's the website? Is it a dot com.au? Surfinglife.com.au. I'm like, is it a dot com or dot com.au? <laughs> yeah, yeah, com au. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, beautiful. So, Surfinglife.com.au, and yeah. we can order the books from there. Yeah, yeah. We've yeah. got tons there. Because our goal is to support Australian writers and creatives. So, um, yeah, I just went about contacting as many people I get my hands on. Um, I know, you know, Kate McMahon? She I was had, just looking at her books. Yeah, um, the Bikini Collective. We've got yeah. those on there. She, so gets a got, big, she gets a big praise from Laura Anava. Yeah, and Steph and yep. Lane. So, um, yeah, if you've got young girls that are into surfing, that's a, a great trilogy and she's writing book forward now. So... Yeah, oh, we've got some crazy um, good books on there. So I've, I've got two things I want to squirrel on. Go. One, I'm going to come back to you supporting um, people in the industry and Australians because I've got a couple of questions around it. Cool. But just on my eco thing of not wanting paper, what I loved, when, and this didn't go past me, today when I was reading your magazine was, okay. I don't know if the, if the watchers can watch this, can you just explain what, what these are and what this means for publishing and, what, and why you've got the certification? Well, see, that was the funny thing when you went, you were talking about going, oh, I'm going paper free office because paper's bad for the environment. Well, if the process. <laughs> I'm just blaming the blonde. <laughs> yeah, no, I can see it's died, so you can't blame that. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, the, it's the it's the bleach that kills the blonde the brain cell <laughs> yeah that's right uh, the more the uh, more i go in there the wider i get <laughs> yeah well that does happen too i i just mine goes wider but it's not to do with bleach or sun it's to do with old age <laughs> um uh so there as you said there was this big push about having paper-free um offices because it's bad for the environment and all of that and 
the craziest thing about uh, digital devices, they're full of precious metals that aren't renewable. They are recyclable, but I'm going to ask how many actual phones and laptops are getting recycled. And I pray that more and more do get recycled. And, they and get if you're recycled listening and properly. you're not sure, you can Google it. There is people, you, you can take them to places specifically. So when I, I had my business, we'd take them to a special electronics recycler. Yeah, yeah. Um, although so if you watch, them in the bin. yeah, if you watch uh, the ABC's War on Waste, you'll see uh, factories full of computers unrecycled and warehouses full. And it's just like, I'm not sure that it is happening as it should happen, but um, we got a massive push between uh, towards recyclable and renewable. And the interesting thing about print is first, they rarely get chucked out. I mean, there's people with magazines that are decades old. Uh-huh. Um, and like the book story we said, your book didn't get thrown out. It got handed on and on and on and on, lived forever. Uh, but on top of that, um, if a proper plantation grown for print or paper use is renewable. The paper is recyclable. The paper we use, we use the highest quality stock we can. And uh, the guys that do the recycling of them, the ones that don't sell, um, want our stock because it's the higher quality the stock it is, the better it is for recycling. So we make sure we've got a high quality stock that's better for recycling. Um, it's got a percentage of recycled paper in there, but it's, it comes from a renewable source anyway. Personally, if anyone's listening and they know where to get me my, my hands on um, cost-effective hemp paper, then I'm keen. That's what I want to do. Because I think hemp as a product is probably a oh, world I know. leader. Yeah. I know I've got some people in my tribe that are massive on the hemp trade. Uh, yep. There's actually a girl that came through my business accelerator in Bali that was wanting to start the Amazon for hemp. And yep. she, she, she's been facing a whole lot of um, getting blacklisted and sort of facing some challenges, but she wanted to start like a um, wholesale trade and a hemp um, distribution list so that things like this, you can just go, okay, cool. I need it for print. I need yep. it for coffee cups. I need it for Whatever. So many things. It's just yeah. like it, as a product, it's one of the best. I mean, there's a reason they called it weed. It's because it's pest resistant. It doesn't require herbicides. It's like a fungal resistant. It grows like a weed. <laughs> weed uh, needs a tenth of the water that um, cotton does. Uh, I think it's it. Uh, paper plantations don't require a lot of um, um, water, but it does take a lot longer for them to grow and mm-hmm. and hemp grows so damn quickly. So, well, maybe that's be- that's the shout out through the network. I'm going to share this into um, the Bali Accelerator and see what we can get there because I know there was quite a few people getting on that movement. See if we can get you a source. That'd be great, and obviously it's got to be a premium product. We can't. Can't be substantial. We can't print rubbish, so no. we, don't, we don't print rubbish. We, we won't print, print on rubbish. weeds, but not rubbish. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. As long as it's quality weed. <laughs> quality yeah. weeds. And we're good to go. Uh, awesome. So. Um, beautiful. So my squirrel of where I wanted to go is uh, I had a number of questions coming in about how you support different subsectors of the industry. Yep. So let's start with first. You said that you wanted to look after as many Australian writers and creators of, as possible. What's the, give me the core sort of vision, mission values of surfing life. How do you choose who you're going to work with and what what is it that you're trying to do by supporting? Well, we, we want to work with the best and that doesn't matter what your sex, colour, age, anything is. So the reality of it is um, I don't know if it's, can you have a look on that same page that you're on just there? Because I can't rem- remember. Mm-hmm. Now, what down, middle, near the bottom, above that green space. Not wrong, wrong issue. The issue after that. All right. So put that away. So the issue after that, <laughs> the issue after that, we've actually got a small panel there that says female contributors want it. We want female writers. We want female um, photographers. Um, 
we work with as many as we can find, um, but it, it, it's hard to find them. Um, it's, it's an interesting space when you talk about photographers. If you were swimming around in the ocean for five hours, it's, it's hard work. Um, I'm not saying the girls can't do it. I just haven't found many that necessarily want to do it. And if they do want to do it, more than happy to work with them. We want to work with everybody. Um, through Corona, it actually we actually got the opportunity to um, draw back and do what I actually wanted to do since I took over, and that is um, make my wife the editor of um, Surfing Life. So Surfing Life currently has the first female editor of a mainstream surf mag. Ah, oh, I've got goosebumps. Possibly in the world, and she's not just female, she's also Indigenous. indigenous. So yeah, she's the first female cool. Indigenous writer. So, hundred percent, we know that she'd be the first female Indigenous, but possibly also the first female of a mainstream surf mag. And I'm not talking about because you've got Surf Girl magazine, and then there's yeah, um, there's, a few, there's a couple of different ones. This is mainstream. This is you know, uh, well, we we see ourselves as one of the top um, surf magazines in the country, um, and we rate ourselves up there in the world as well without being too proud but um, like i find the magazine in in a, the majority if there's beach uh airports in the world so i know when i've been cruising through um the different airports if i've got my board bag i can usually pick myself up with surfing life yeah there you go um so as far as that kind of thing is it's it's quality that we work with uh like we support young artists we in the last issue it was um, we did a story on um, shapers and we made sure we got um, young Jalan Slab, who's a female Indigenous shaper at Fingal. And we got an Indigenous, young Indigenous fellow to shoot the profile photo. So um, we're all about building a team uh, of people who are passionate. And that's the only requirement is passion. If you don't have passion, I don't care what your skin colour is, what your gender is, what your how old you are doesn't matter. Um, if you're passionate and you're pushing forward and you want to get involved and um, you're happy to learn and you, that's all, that's what matters. Um, and on top of that, it still has to be high quality writing and high quality photographer photography, because we owe that to our readers. Our readers pay good money. So they need to get our best because that's what they pay for. That that's what they pay for. Uh, and I am, I'm hundred percent on board with that coming from uh, a recruitment background. And I was actually asked a few years ago to come on to the ABC breakfast show and speak about pay gap inequality and um, all the disparities and, and things like that. And one of the things I really stand against is filling quotas. Uh, and I think that it has a detrimental effect on sexism, racism. If, if businesses are hiring or, any industry is hiring or distributing their work based on a quota, you end up with substandard people that aren't able to do the job to the right level getting hired. And then what that happens is it actually has a detrimental effect on, on their subsector because mm -hmm. then they get blamed. It's because they are a girl. It is because they're indigenous. It is because they're from a minority. It is because yeah, of yeah. this, that they, didn't do the job. No, you just hired the wrong person for the job because you Correct. just fill a quota rather Correct. than finding the right person for the job. So with your eye and your eyes need to be open to that is that uh, I, the, the idea behind having a certain amount of females or indigenous or whatever, um, it, like all ideas, it, it it's aimed to do the right thing, but because it becomes a rule, um, and not a guiding principle, that's when it falls apart. So the government, yeah, government makes it a rule and then as opposed to businesses making a principle to be open to everyone. And I, I, I honestly think one of the worst discriminated against, discriminated against sector at the moment is the aged. Yep. They're the worst. The oh. worst. I'm like, give me them. They're smart. But then again, I want the youth too because I want to see them develop as well. So, Well, the balance though, right? And again, I can draw back on recruitment. Oh my God, we, I did specialty sales and executive recruitment across all industries, surfing included. And age was a massive thing where they didn't look at 
what could be done. And it was it was a hugely discriminated uh, sector of, yeah, yeah. of our population. Um, I'm glad we touched on this because it was actually Millie in the Surf Witches group had asked me to ask you, uh, what are you doing to promote female surfers as athletes and not sexualized objects? Oh, I'd, li- <laughs> I'd like to know how, when was the last issue she picked up um, of our magazine. I don't know about the other magazines, um, but... Uh, I, I didn't see anything bad in this one, that's for sure. No, 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 we don't. There's no sexualization. I'm a, I'm a father and a husband. I don't, I don't promote any of that. But I don't for either sex, male or female. So um, we are a, a high-performance surf magazine. That's what we are. So we're all about the, um, the quality of the surfing as opposed to whether someone looks good or not. Um, and uh, like this next issue, I was like going, oh, gee, we've got more girls than guys in it. So are we a bit out of balance now? So, um, but if, you, if you're if you ripping and you, we've got good shots and it's a great story, it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter. I mean, we've done stuff with, um, of late uh, with Otis Carey. Um, we also did um, a story when Steph did the paddle out for surfing solidarity. Um, so we've got a lot of those sorts of stories, but then when it goes to um, the female side of things, yeah, we've been over the last, you've got one issue. So it's a, it's a bit hard to see because um, males dominate the pop, the surfing population. Uh, and that's only because of, you know, it's like going to play golf. It's, it's, Unless you're surfing Kira on a longboard day. Oh, yeah. And then you, <laughs> then the men are the minorities. Absolutely. I think that I've seen a massive shift in like from when I was um, growing up. But see, for me, it's never been an issue. I've always loved seeing the girls out in the surf and encouraged them. And um, I, I think it's much better for the lineup when there's girls out there than just aggro guys. And that's just yeah. got guys are guys and girls are girls. And you know, never the twain shall meet. But um, now we've been promoting. And our first, when I took over and the first editor I put on was Brad Bricknell, and he's a massive advocate for um, girls in surfing. Um, obviously, my wife being, the, she was a sub-editor for three years before she took over as um, the editor. So obviously there's going to be already that drive. Um, but, yeah, I mean, last year, uh, no, this year, no, about a year ago. So our surfer issue last year, we did a story on Jodie Cooper. Now, if you know who Jodie Cooper is, you'll know her what her story is um, and what she had to put up within the industry. And then we did Parch Light and we've done Carissa Moore. And um, yeah, so that's what we're doing. Yeah. Tons, and tons. and I, you have a podcast associated um, with right. Surfing Life as well. Two, two questions before I squirrel off on that. Why is the podcast not named Surfing Life Podcast? Why is it called The Paddle Out? Like, why Why is there a different name? Uh, why is um, the WSL podcast called The Lineup and not called the WSL podcast? Also a good question. <laughs> Just because it's <laughs> nice to uh, differentiate something. Um we talked. We thought about calling it the Surfing Life Podcast, but or Surfing Life Podcast, but it didn't really run. The paddle out sounds great, and it's brought to you by the Surfing Life, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, but what I do love is the last episode. I think that is out because I think you're on pause for a second. Was actually with an amazing young girl, or maybe she's not. How young is she? <laughs> she's 20, 25. 25. Yeah. Still, in my books, that's very young. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you had some great conversations in there about um, the industry and about like getting the the equality in there and, and what's going on. It's, honestly, I can't remember those conversations because um, that's just normal conversations for me. So it's not something that I remember doing because we did it special or extra. It's just standard just, conversation yeah it just came across as what it what it is well, how did yeah right. yeah exactly yeah. so and, and shane hoare and my co-host which most people know who know surfing is a legend and shane actually 
so during the ASP days, the Association of Surfing Professionals, before it became the WSL, right back at the beginning when they started with the likes of Pam Burridge and um, Lisa Anderson and those guys, that they actually had a surfers meeting and the girls weren't invited. And the guys at that period, and I know that sexism in surfing was rank back in those days. I was a rope cut for being a girl at Ballina North Wall. And there you go. So they were voting to have all of the girls' professional comp- competition wiped out so that the money could be given to the men. And Shane was the only person that stood up and said, no, our, our, the surfing as a sport would suffer if it was just men. So he's, um, and we align ourselves with advocates like that and people that believe in, and uh, you know, equality is the best way to say it, but the reality of it is it's just doing the right thing. So um, good human. Yeah, being a good, yeah, being a a human world, just being a human, to be honest. Um, So, yeah, so that's kind of who we align ourselves with in that space. Um, And every editor that we've had since taking over um, has been of that mindset as well. So, before Lystra, we had Jed Smith, and he's very pro um, Indigenous and um, uh, female surfing and stuff. So, we've always aligned ourselves with that. Um, type of person or that kind of creative um, yeah so that's just who we are and how we roll so how come June was the last podcast well because we and I'm like I'm like jonesing to go through it I'm like have I lost something did Spotify stop publishing what happened <laughs> yeah I know it's it feels like a long time ago for us as well so um, the main reason is because we got into conversation with Fuel TV and Fuel TV have we've signed a contract for with them to turn our podcast into a TV show. Oh, high five! That doesn't suck, does it? That's pretty good, and that'll be and that's Fuel TV Global. Um, so that's 104 countries with um, sort of a reach of about 250 million plus wow, uh, no ha- household reach. Ah, whatever. It's, <laughs> can't change what I look like, so just go with it. That's what <laughs> I say. Uh, is Shane still going to be your your co-host? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So it's Shane and I, and then special guests. So love it. Yeah, we'll be having. Two. I uh, I do recommend having a listen to that last episode because just I had the visual when he's talk when they're talking about the going out on the biggest day and getting out on the jet skis back when jet skis weren't so great and hitting ten foot chop and the drop and I was like oh. Like the whole time, I was just, yeah, yeah. Fun things I do listen to podcasts while I'm showering. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, ah, ah. like just the thought of it's making me want to, yeah, yeah, break. yeah, yeah. He's crazy, there's no two ways about it. The guy has charged some of the biggest stuff, um, and yeah, and he was one of the first. He was like, wasn't doing it with Jessica's, he was doing it with Zodiacs, those rubber. Oh my god, the rubber duckies, yeah, the old surf life saving rubber duckies. He, yeah, yeah, he was. They were doing it on that before no. there was such thing as a jet ski. Yeah, the three, two or three seated jet skis have only come out in the last, you know, handful of years. It was yeah. before that. It was those silly stand up ones that were almost impossible to <laughs> drive. Yeah. But yeah, no, um, yeah, he's he's a madman. So yeah, no, we're very excited about the uh, paddle out going to TV. So paddle out TV. Yeah. How long? When can we? When can we expect it? Uh, December. Sick. So yeah, we are, it's on seven plus in Australia, awesome. uh, and then who, what? I don't know whatever it is around the world. It's like yeah, Brazil and America and yeah, everywhere. Awesome. Um, have you got your first guest lined up? Have it's we probably, heard the sneak it's probably going to be uh, Isabella. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, it's a, it is an awesome episode. Yeah, um, yeah, she's yeah, she's incredible. So yeah, she's super awesome. We've now, actually already I... shot a pilot with her, and then we'll pull her back to actually shoot the proper show. So oh, cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, what I didn't get in the conversation though was what's the biggest surf that you've been out in? Oh crikey! And how many sponsors did you have on your board at the time? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you're chasing sponsors. I hear you're uh, you're trying to gather as many as you can. 
That was what I, no, I did that before I had surfing life. Um, <laughs> since I took over surfing life, I've stopped that. I was it. Well, the, the sponsor thing, that's a kind of a, <laughs> a, bit of a funny story. Um, well, so we can I, start there. Let's start let's, there. All right. Let's start there. <laughs> and then, then we'll do, we won't even think about how big the surf I've been in. Um, it was all of four and a half foot, wasn't it? Yeah. It's not big. <laughs> so it was snapper I, on a wind chop day. <laughs> I, I was, um, I was working with a ex pro surfer, Drew Adler, and he was, he was big in the aerial surfing maybe 10 years ago. You know, he'd beaten Josh Kerr and all these guys. And the very first um, <clears throat> surf event he went in, he won it. I mean, air event he went in, he won it at um, up at uh, Naranek. It was a Quicksilver event. So, and, he's, and he had sponsors. And I'm like, Alan, like, I know you surf really well, but what's the difference between you and me for people sponsoring me? You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, and then I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to get myself a sponsor. And then after about two years, I was at 13 sponsors. <laughs> so I had shoes, watches, wax, sunnies, clothes, boards, fins, magnesium salt. I had uh, ASN, which was sports nutrition. My friend started ASN. Oh, really? Yeah, Simon Rees and uh, yeah, Grant Simon. Mayo. And Simon. Mayo's got um, Nutrition Warehouse now. Yeah, Simon's, I know Simon very well. So yeah, Simon's no, actually my first sponsor. Um, no way. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I laid, the, I laid the floor of their Bondi store. Yeah. Yeah, right. I, I, yeah, I helped. <laughs> the agency I was at had, um, I got them on as a client when I was there. So um, <laughs> I bumped into him uh, only like, I don't know, maybe two months ago. Uh, at, yeah, with yeah, Grant Mayo yeah. at the same time. It was like super weird. Yeah, he's doing good now after his little cancer scare, which was pretty, you know, he he faced that with um, great integrity, I thought. Um, yeah, so I just went about getting sponsors and I had like, I don't know, I think I was. Give us your pitch. I hear a salesman there and this, for anyone that's listening that's got a business, <laughs> pitching for sponsors, pitching for support, pitching for anything. I think there's a lesson in here. How do you go about it? What's the What's the core technique? Well, it was just, I based it on my Instagram following, which was, it's at about 24,000, I think at the moment. So it's a decent following. Um, I just said, hey, listen, you know, I'm looking for sponsors. Um, I'm not looking for cash because it was just all, ca all, all gear flow. I said, I'm just <laughs> looking for product. Yeah. Um, I'd love it if you check out my profile and, you know, see I post daily and, you know, would push your stuff. So if you're interested and I just send that out and, I, I I get people call. I had like three this week contact me going, hey, we want to collab with you and sponsor you. And I'm like, I can't. Yeah, see, I get those and it's always like swimsuits or something. <laughs> like mine's mine's watches. I, I get lots of watches and sunnies. So really? Mm. What well, is there a special brand of watch that you're preferring at the moment? Are, you, are we talking only surf performance watches or are they time pieces? Uh, the, the watch sponsor I had was, uh, was a timepiece. Um, yeah. they were called seven Friday. They were a beautiful, uh, watch. Um, we're doing some collab. Today. Yeah. We're doing a collab with wear it, which do, um, good surf and, and beautiful timepieces. Um, I'm a big fan of my root curl GPS watch. I love using it cause I like tracking my surfs because <laughs> deep down I'm just a, a nerd like we all are yeah everyone's uh, a nerd no one just no one just admits nah, it, i uh i say oh. i'm happy to own that i am a complete podcast geek uh yeah, yeah i i'm a learning junkie yeah yeah I, I, it. <laughs> yeah no i'm a complete nerd but someone asked me on a date once they said do i want to ted talks and chill <laughs> is that that would be a good that would be a good date for you would it ted talking to you uh, <laughs> that, then they sent me a ted talks book with the <laughs> with asking me <laughs> I, I, don't even, I don't even understand <laughs> oh that's how much of a dork i am they sent me a book to go with a ted talks date yeah <laughs> such a dork <laughs> Oh, um, so yeah, that's um that was that. That was just a bit of fun, really. A mate, and, a mate and I did it together, and we both collected quite a few. 
How um, many can you get for me? I've got 25,000 connections on LinkedIn. Can you hook me up? What can I get? Well, I don't know, whatever you want. It's just asking <laughs> the right people. <laughs> Everyone thinks I'm sponsored by Notox, but I, I'm just, I'm sponsoring them because I'm such, and actually this is a nice segue. I am such a believer in trying to go more sustainable uh, and conscious with all of the products I buy. And so if I can support someone that's, that's doing that, I, I'm all about it. And I, I, it didn't go past me that the very first page, I just flicked the book today and the very first page that showed up was, there you go. I'm like, huh, <laughs> that's poignant. How long's your relationship been going with Notox and how important is it to you to build long-term relationships? And there's a question in there for business owners. What's the lesson in, um, in relationship building that people should know? Lesson in relationship building is um, building a relationship. It has nothing to do with making money or turning them into a client. Um, if that's your goal, your relationships will be skinny and they'll be short and they'll be not even worth having. Um, I, I have uh, clients that have followed me from agency to agency just because they they go from clients to friends and not like, oh, you know, have them around for beer every weekend type of friends. Like there's different levels of friends, I believe. Um, and yeah, I can, I can call blokes from three businesses ago and talk to them like it was yesterday. Um, and the, because we had, we just got a good, I just have good relationships with people. And that's my goal is just to maintain good relationships People started advertising with us at, in Surfing Life and now no longer. It doesn't matter. They're still the same people to me. If they can support me and I can support them, then that's the goal. So I just think, um, I just think Western society has a poor measure on wealth um, and mm. wealth has got nothing to do with the zeros in um, bank accounts. Yeah. yeah, it's got, I mean, I'm richer than Zuckerberg as, as far as I'm concerned. I've got, I work from home. We homeschool our kids. My wife works from home. Well, excuse me, that your mates. Um, uh, I get to go surfing when I want to. I go on editorial trips to the Maldives and the Mints and I get to produce something that I'm very proud of is in the creative space. Um, I'm still shooting photos because I love that. Um, making videos. I, you know, I'm just a creative junkie in that sense. Um, but when it comes to building relationships, it just doesn't matter what you get out of it. It kind of matters what you put into it. Um, and from there, everything flows. And there's your pixie dust and fairy wings, whatever. <laughs> uh, beautiful. So when it comes to having advertisers in the magazine, though, are you? is there any, like, rules? Like, I have a no dickhead policy. Uh, if people don't pass the no dickhead policy, they don't get on my client list. Do you have any filters or... Or even who does who who does your business development in terms of bringing on new clients for advertising and do they have rules? You, how do you choose who you're going to go after? Because there's so many people you could go after, right? It's pretty easy in the surf industry because a lot of the um, people are um, pretty cool, cool guys because they've found surfing and surfing changes you in many different ways. Um, yeah, I think you attract like for like as it is. So if you're if you're a good person, you attract good people. If you're a narcissist, you attract narcissists. If you're a piece of work, you attract pieces of work. So um, the old, to use the old cliche, my vibe attracts my tribe. And that's just reality. And you find out soon enough the guys that, um, or people that give you curry and you kind of just don't, put as much effort into chasing those. Um, but I think everyone deserves a chance um, and everyone deserves a chance to not be a dickhead. And I think we all have that ability to, to be both. Everyone has that ability to be an idiot or not be an idiot. And I think with the right opportunities, even the idiots out there are still worth working with because you never know who they can turn into. Beautiful. I love it. So is there anyone though that you've, and you don't have to name and shame them, but is there, have you ever said no to having someone in the magazine? Yeah, I have. What was the situation behind that and why did you do it? Um, they 
thought they they thought I had no value, um, and they thought everything that they were saying was the only value. Um, and at that point, you, I just sort of go, okay, well, that's fine. That's and that's their that's their opinion. Um, but there's certain clients that or certain uh, brands that I won't go after. Um, mm-hmm. I've had, I mean, a gazillion contacts for um, online gambling um, f- to run it through our website and I flat out refuse um, gambling sites. Um, I don't uh, care if someone gambles. That doesn't worry me. If someone wants to put some money down on the GGs, well, good luck to them. Uh, but I won't promote that. I don't think gambling's necessarily a healthy thing. Um, I think some people can be healthy with it, but it's not something that I'll promote. Um, That's actually a huge one for me. I um, I get so pissed off watching sporting, um, watching things on the Sporting Channel like on Clio or something, promoting gambling, especially because there's so many young, impressionable kids that are watching the, the footy, watching the UFC, mm. watching these things when this is an addictive, we're not allowed to advertise cigarettes anymore. Yeah. But yet we can be advertising to young children about gambling yeah. and making it seem cool and that everyone's got to be doing it. Like a, that's a, it's a real bug yeah. there for me. And I actually worked with a client recently who came to me. He was going through a conscious change and he used to run a gambling website. Yeah, and our right. whole goal while working together was for him to replace his income just to the level of being able to live, to make a living, not make the money that he was making from it because he at a soul level was like, this is n- not okay. No, and he, yeah. People he know now, he now promotes juices and teaches people how to come o- overcome chronic pain and ALS through juicing and mindset and hypnotherapy. And it's like in one year completely flipped it and he's making more money now. You know what the addiction is, though, don't you? And to be honest, social media is as bad as gambling sites. Mm-hmm. And it's the addiction is to dopamine. Yeah. Unfortunately, as surfers, we are just as addicted to dopamine as anyone. So people go, oh, how, what's, what drives you to surf? And it's, it's the dopamine. The rush. <laughs> well, it's not the rush. It's dopamine. It, so the dopamine is unexpected treats is what it's scientifically proven. So, um, yeah, so uh, fishing. Mm-hmm. golf surfing all those you know you get one little bite when you're fishing you're like you can stay there for another hour for one <laughs> little bite it's like and That's what sur- media, I call it boring for likes likes exactly oh you get it every time you get that buzz on your phone oh that dopamine hit so um I have no notifications on my phone turn that shit yeah off. yeah yeah absolutely because dopamine's it's not a bad thing it's just a it's just good to identify it the, as the drug and gambling taps into that because there's unexpected, you could win, you know, you could get it. Well, when I was recruiting, I, um, I had a candidate that would work for aristocrat, the, the gaming machines. The, I know aristocrat very well. Yeah. And had been getting poached by all the new social media and gaming that was coming out because they wanted to hack the psychology, like all the lights and the sounds. And this is when just before, like, I think when candy crush was starting to, go yep. crazy and yep. they're literally employing scientists and psychologists and all of these people to be able to make you addicted and like that's what those those games on facebook and that are all about it's like what colors what sound what what yep. things yeah. do you need to make you bored yeah gaming also um, like video games actually relies on and computer addiction relies on something uh, above that and that is so if you initially get the dopamine the dopamine for devices to get you back onto the device so facebook and instagram and those but when it comes to um like your xboxes and stuff like that they rely on the non-blinking so at the point where you stop blinking and that's why you can find yourself for an hours on a computer on going down rabbit holes on the, in the internet is because you stop blinking and the stopping blinking causes the addiction. Is that what happens when you take drugs? They don't blinking as well. <laughs> actually, I'm actually, I'm not da- down on that. I know you, you see some ice addicts running around. They don't look like they're blinking much either. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually think there's a lot of chemicals going on there. That's more than just... <laughs> <laughs> just between uh, you and me, I think is more than just not yeah. blinking. <laughs> no, but they, I think there's, 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it does something to you in that sense. But I will answer your question from before. Um, last year I was in the Maldives uh, on our in our board test, uh, doing our board Bible um, with Matt Wilkinson. And it was a fun board test because we're like Maldives, fun waves. And the longest board we had was like a five, nine, and it was six to eight foot. And I was like, and then I just paddled out on this little five, six in the six foot to eight foot conditions and it didn't handle very well. The you board was well. amazing. You just felt very undergun. So probably I think 10 foot's about the biggest I've surfed, but not in a long time. I like three to four. Maybe so two. is that actual surfing or when, we're, when I was listening to the podcast with Shane, some people just paddle out and say they went for surf. I've been there. I've been out at 12 foot freshwater. It yeah. resulted in a broken nose and an hour of me thinking I was going to die trying to get back in. Yeah. And I only paddled out because someone was like, what are you, some sort of girl? <laughs> I got yeah. no business being out here on an eight foot long board. No, no, we don't. Oh, no, no. Yeah, no. And I only rode a long board and I hadn't been wet in probably maybe three years at that stage. Yeah. But yeah. No, yeah, I've, I've surfed 10 foot, but. Uh, yeah, I don't like to do it much these days. Too much. I don't. I don't. I'm not adrenaline junkie like I used to be when I used to free climb 30 meter cliffs without ropes. So, but that was Ooh. back in my climbing days when I was a junkie, adrenaline yeah. junkie. Yeah. Yeah. So no, all, you know, it's age does that to you. Didn't age or, or having like family and a wife you love and. Uh. Fingers got sore. Yeah, I think I, I think um, for men, it's just as your testosterone reduces, you don't have that same drive. Um, because twenty years ago, you know, I was married, so um, it's just it's just a reduction in testosterone, and that, it's a simple fact. And you just get smarter, and you just get you work out what you actually really want as a man or as a person, as opposed to. Um, a, what you think you want and it's fun and it's thrilling and it's exciting, but you just sort of go, ah, it's, is it worth it? And yeah. That's pretty much it. But I, you are right though. Having kids certainly makes a difference. How old are you kids? I have a 10 and turning 12. And you said you're homeschooled them, right? Correct. Yeah. Do you apply any specific methodologies or just talk me through because uh, I'm I'm big for unschooling, and one of the reasons why I became a Mind Valley teacher is to give the finger to traditional education. Um, yeah, traditional education it has a lot of issues, in my opinion. So, um, here's I'll give you my quick su- summation. I don't believe homeschooling is for everyone, um, but if you can, it is the best thing you can do. Our kids were barely making through their grades and now they're VHA in every single subject, every single semester or term or whatever it is, because apparently I wasn't very good at school either. Um, But that was just, again, because of the education system. So the education system started back because intelligence is not ownership of the educated intelligence is intelligence doesn't matter whether you're book smart or street smart intelligence lives in its own space and intelligence is not your ability to memorize a fake history book and regurgitate it back so rote learning um i am actually a big believer in rote learning is extremely important rote learning is how you and i learned to talk so our mum sat us down and went mum, 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 mum until we remembered mum and dad, dad, dad until we remembered dad. So rote learning is extremely important because that's about forming neural pathways in the brain. It's like Bruce Lee said, I'm not scared of a man who has practiced a thousand kicks. I'm scared of a man who's practiced one kick a thousand times because it becomes muscle memory in your brain's muscle. So that muscle memory is extremely important. So we still get our kids to, do, to learn their timetables, parrot fashion. Um, that's extremely important because if you've got that muscle memory there and those neural pathways there, you don't have to think about that. It just becomes reaction. That way, if you've got that neural pathway that it's instant reaction, you can then reserve the creative, like all that thinking that you would have done gets reserved for the creative, then it's just automatic and then creative you actually get to focus in on. So 
before schools were schools and education was education, they worked out in the farms and in the fields and, and then someone learned how to read and someone learned how to write. And then a smart farmer said to his kids, there's a school teacher in town. You're going to need to learn how to read and write because I can see the future because I'm not an idiot. I'm not educated, but I'm not an idiot. So he sent his kids off because he couldn't read and he couldn't write. So therefore he needed someone to teach him that, but we can all read and write. So therefore we don't need someone to teach reading and writing because we can teach it. On top of that, we have this crazy little thing called the internet and you can find whatever else, whatever you want to on that. You can self-educate, which I've done since my very first six month course as a diploma of graphic design 30 years ago and haven't been done a course since but and that was analog design now I'm in all digital spaces with all vents from that so at the point where um, uh, society moved to um, schooling via the industrial revolution and that's where we're stuck so schooling is based in the industrial revolution oh. you check in you sit down in your rows you say yes you do your job you have your lunch break you come back in you do your job you clock out and then you're done that's schooling that's industrial revolution whereas we know you're that ready to go work in a factory when a bell goes you get to eat correct. Then, you, then you go back to your production line slash desk correct yeah, exactly. The modern, modern production line is your desk where I'm, I'm loving Corona because or COVID because it's driven people to work remotely and hopefully bosses see that they can trust their staff. You know, they can trust their team to go and get the job done. It doesn't matter when you wake up. doesn't matter when you go to sleep. It doesn't matter how big your lunch break does. As long as the job you're given to do gets done. And we're the same with our kids. We're just like, listen, go up and then do your school. I don't care if you knock it out by nine o'clock in the morning or if it, you're still going at six o'clock at night. That's up to you. They generally knock it out really quickly so they can play for the rest of the day because they're intelligent and they're getting educated as well. So that was the main reason. The main, well, the main reason we started it is um, there was severe bullying uh, for uh, my kids at school, um, for both girls and boys, mainly the girls, to be honest. And um, nothing was being really done about it properly. So we just went and we could, I was watching my daughter deteriorate into a blithering mess. Now she's supremely confident, confident and killing it in, on every space. So um, yeah. Then people say, Oh, what about social, social, like where, where are they learning socialization? I'm like, seriously, you think, and another a 10 year old can teach another 10 year old how to be good in a social <laughs> what i teach my kids how to socialize that's who should be teaching them us because we've learned it all a 10 year old can't teach another 10 year old they end up just being bullies and bitches and and the insecure bullies um end up ruling because of just lack of security yeah um and what other things do you do for them for socialization? Because I know a lot of people that do homeschool and they do different things like nature explorers or they go to surfing groups or they, they've got other avenues that are a little bit more um, life skill based. Yeah. Than farming in like sheep to sit at their desk at a bell. And all doing the same thing. Um, our kids do art classes and drama and um, I take my daughter surfing. That's her school sport. Um yeah, they just have a few things like that. They also um, get taken out on Fridays by someone who takes them to small groups and then they do stuff in those small groups. Um, but they all want to see each other. They're not forced into this position. Yeah. So, yeah, they get plenty of socialisation. I mean, honestly, we do. We have contributor nights um, whenever ever, uh, when each issue comes off the printer. So the local photographers and writers and, you know, whoever we work with come over to our place. We have fire pit, pizzas, beers, and our kids join in that conversation and, you know, hold court. So, uh, love it. Yeah. I'm going to draw a long bow now between something you just said in terms of uh, being scared of the man that practice one kick a thousand times. My long bow is to the wave pool. 
I know you, you, you visited a wave pool recently, didn't you? Yep. What's your thoughts on wave pools in general? Um, how they are going to affect surfing, the, the opportunity for repetition, and, yeah, just wave pools in general. Go. <laughs> Wait, I love wave pools. But I, lo- I love surfing. Um, it's a bit like when someone goes, oh, wave pools are not real and it's not the ocean. And I'm like, yeah, but when I was – and I used to do a lot of skateboarding and I used to love street and I used to love ramp. But it was all skateboarding to me, so it didn't really matter. You just do the bit that's fun at the time. Uh, I haven't, I never got to surf the Yapoon pool. That's still on the uh, bucket list. You were there, weren't you? I was there. Being a good human. I was, I watched hundreds of waves. I photographed hundreds of waves. I produced a a very good publication on the wave pool or with the wave pool in it. Um, But unfortunately, I didn't get my chance to surf it. However, I was invited to the media day down at Urban Surf and surfed that for hours. It's so cold. No, it was warm when I was there. It was so cold. I was there. Oh, man. I was was in boardies in a vest. I thought that uh, my one mil rip curl pants and a rashi was going to cut it because I didn't have time to go and get my steam out of the storage cage before I left. I came out literally blue. I was out for like 20 minutes and someone asked me, a guy came up to me, he's like, are you okay? You're <laughs> really cold. I'm like, yeah, I'm hiring a wetsuit for the next session. <laughs> like, I'm so cold. I couldn't feel my feet when I jumped up on the last wave. I was just like, foot's completely out of, con- out of position. It was. We had a glassy <laughs> still day with full sunlight. I just wore boardies and a vest and... It was amazing. So, yeah, just surf that till I could barely walk. And I put that up in like top 10 surfs of all time. It was so much fun. Just wave after wave. Like a wave every 90 seconds is incredible. Yeah. Um, I, think I, uh, that- I booked late. So I, I, I'm a natural footer and I only got two intermediate left sessions. Um, but I am I'm better on a steep takeoff going left than uh, grabbing rail. That's for sure. Uh, I think that's just from relearning to surf at Bingen um, when I first started surfing again. Yep. But it's, it's a, I was really lucky that I had people that had been before and told me it was a tricky takeoff that it doesn't, it looks easy, does hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. We, so when we turned up and they go, Oh, we're going to start you on this mode and Vaughn Blakey goes, just go straight to beast mode. So we, (laughs) we started on beast mode. Yeah, but you're probably beast mode level. I am young girl that's been on a short, well, not young girl, <laughs> definitely not young girl, uh, young surfer, uh, only been back surfing for just over four years and only on a short board for a year. Yeah, I, did, I didn't. Beast mode murder me. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't miss takeoff. I, I, I skirted with the bottom because Ooh, and they weren't cold. telling us. Yeah, they didn't tell us when they were changing mode. So they had us in like turn six, which is sort of advanced and went to beast mode without saying, hey, we've gone to beast mode. So I've dropped in, checked, went for a top turn and the bottom dropped out. I was like, oh no, we're in beast mode. Just went straight over the handlebar. Oh, did you get any gravel rash? No, I skirted. I, was, uh, I could feel I had- it going by. Because I was on intermediate mode, we had uh, a few intermediates with us at yep. best, uh, which led for some catastrophes on on takeoff and inside and trying to navigate that. And I ended up dragging a foot along the <laughs> like the top of my foot, uh, yeah. trying trying to avoid someone. Uh, I was like, that's about as good as the uh, the gravel rush I got from Karamas, but minus, <laughs> the, minus the sea urchins. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, this, this, so to answer your uh, previous question, I think um, it, firstly, the Yapoon technology, as much fun as I had at Urban Surf, uh, the Yapoon technology is a better uh, shaped wave. It's a much cleaner wave and it's got a, a more realistic shape. Um, as far as uh, using it as a training facility, yeah, to work on things, um, we're not going to see a world title come out of someone who has only ever surfed a wave pool um because to be honest you know, at, well at 80 bucks a session 80. or free in the ocean and they're going to put their hours in the ocean 
Um, so can I punch a code of your phone though? No, nah, not yet. But, but when they open up, but they'll they'll sell that technology. They've already got sites in Australia, so it won't be long before that technology is available. Um, I think it's amazing. It's great for testing boards because um, you get the same wave over and over. Um, great for practicing manoeuvres. Couldn't agree more. Um, but when you you know if you're talking about competition surfing, then heat strategy in an ocean is still something you can't learn in a in a okay your waves first and your wave second. That just doesn't work that way. So listen, Actually, that's what I loved about um, your conversation with Isabella. Was yeah. even talking about the soft edges and the and the competition strategy, and obviously anyone that's watched or listened to anything on Slater and the, the mind fuck that is <laughs> or Andy that is sitting in a heat and um, jockeying someone or you know getting inside their head or being knowing the just the way selection right yeah absolutely I mean he never got inside Mick's head Mick could just shut him out so um, and then Parker, Parker would try to get in Mick's head but Mick would shut him out too even though they're great mates <laughs> um, but yeah, there's just so much more to surfing. Um, and if you took the view that, um, oh, it's not the ocean, then it's a closed-minded view anyway. And in life, you've got closed-minded people and that's fine. They just need to do their thing. Uh, for me, I I just like all forms of surfing. I'll jump on a male when it's half a foot and I'll jump on a softy when it's a beachy. I'll jump on a twin when it's a fatter wave, I'll jump on a thruster when it's top to bottom. And um, I like, I like all forms. The only thing I don't like lying down. I don't like belly boarding or bodyboarding. I don't like supping. <laughs> I don't like. Oh, <laughs> oh, goat boating. Oh, I've got, I know I'm actually friends of like a seven time world champion. Who's just incredible on a goat boat. Um, Reese Duncan, but um no, that's not for me either. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, forms of surfboards I like. Um, maybe I don't like subs because I've been hit and nearly killed by them. Nearly killed by too many of them because they're just yeah. out of control. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I just think it's closed mindedness that doesn't allow you to um, appreciate a wave pool. As far as wave pools in competition, when you watch Kelly's, it's really hard. I don't enjoy it so much because I'm like, it's turn, 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 barrel, kinder, turn, turn, barrel, kinder, turn. There we go. Yeah. So there's no, and you know what's missing there that addicts us so much? There's no dopamine. Yeah, because there's not that little reward. The, yeah. 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 The little yeah. Yeah. But soccer fanatics are huge in dopamine too because oh. you know they're like going, Oh, it's only one goal. You know, people go, it's so boring, they only get one goal, but that one that goal. One hit. <laughs> so um, but yeah, I think I think wave pools are incredible. I think they're unbelievable. So much fun. But I like theme parks too. So but I don't go to a theme park every day, every do I? Day. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, um, no, I think there's definitely the the time and the place, the space for it. I'm all about sort of everything. I do think that uh, when you look at, like you said, have, building that muscle memory and and the opportunity. If, but the only the only thing I see being an issue competition wise is, is it going to come down to the people that have got the bucks to be able to get in there or the sponsors that get them in the in the pools that they can really craft their skill and and get more water time more more chance to perfect their their craft over the young kid that's struggling and strapping it and groveling out out here out here on slop day um, versus someone that's got the bucks to to be in a pool well if you see how many international surfers come to australia and start surfing here the same thing's already happening with the ocean like the gold coast is the hotbed yeah. of talent yeah yeah, and they send them here with all that money as well. Uh, it, the whole struggling kid type of thing, uh, Nick Carroll talked about this years ago when he believed, he actually heralded the um, Brazilian storm because he was like, 
you know, all of our blue collar workers that used to live on the beach aren't living on the beach anymore because it's been bought by white and silver collar workers. So that whole um, uh, coming up from your bootstraps type of uh, surfer is already pretty much um, gone or well on the way out. Um, So that's just a societal coastal sea change thing as opposed to um, um, being able to afford to go in wave pools. So you'll get um, uh, organisations like Surfing Australia and they will then fund these kids to go into it. So if they if they identify them as talents because they spot them at a Grom search or whatever, then they'll get the funding they need. Um it's often so the whole money thing often happens at the point where you get soccer mums and dads, or our version of soccer mums and dads forcing their kids into it, wanting to yeah. live vicariously through yeah. their children. Exactly. So I see them out here and I get so mad. The dad that's, what the fuck were you thinking? Blah, blah. And there's like this little tacker that says, like, I just missed yeah. my turn. Yeah. Like, I tried to do a floater and fell. Like, <laughs> like dad, yeah. So dad. that's not going to, that's not going to change anyway. So, and that's generally the people with money and kids without talent. So that's all we're talking about. Yeah. Talent shines through whether you got money or not. That's yeah. all honesty. Like Mick Fanning came from nothing. Dingo came from nothing. Parker came from nothing. All of these names that we know now, yeah. they came. They didn't come from a lot of money. They just came from a passion to surf. But they did have the opportunity to get sponsors. And if we look at like the way why I think women's surfing has just like skyrocketed in the last few years and like if you i know you're your friends with lane and if you if you think back to the struggle street that they had the girls didn't have the opportunity to get as anywhere near as good as the guys because they didn't have the the resources or the backing they just couldn't make a living and they couldn't they didn't have the cash to put into a coach or to to, to hone in the craft and the minute we started to see the girls getting a bit of funding they're ability perceived ability they had the ability to birth to start off with they just didn't have a chance to turn the dial up just went through the roof yeah i think there there's definite realities to the statement you're making there and i i think that um um you're correct when that funding comes for these people it does make a massive difference um but that's more now identified on a um, state and national level um, with the uh, surfing bodies, they're, they're identifying them now and they are giving the money to the girls. But to be honest, when Lane was going through, she didn't have, no one had coaches. So it, it's, it wasn't a coaching thing. The whole coaching thing's only happened in the last, lucky if it's a decade, maybe less. Um, uh, there's more was um, funding to travel. Yeah. And get to events and, that's actually still hard for a lot of guys now, guys and girls now. I mean, it's hard for, for both. Um, but you're right. Once the money started came, coming in for the girls, a, a massive difference happened. Um, I, my bugbear with competition surfing and between men and female is that they always put the girls out in the crap. And I hate that because I think the girls rip there was one year that they ran and unfortunately this is still based on what cash is in the, in the sport. Um, But one year they ran a back to back cloud break event, which meant they didn't overlap. They went girls are on for the first two weeks. Boys are on the second two weeks. And And if the girl, if the girls scored waves and the boys did it, and that's what happened. The girls got all the waves. And by the time the guys got there, no, the wave were nowhere near as good. And that's just like, there you go. The girls can just surf what they've got to surf. Yeah, the hand that you don't. Exactly. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, the ace is being kept aside for the men all the time. And I'm, I'm big on that. Um, my other thing is I actually think um, they need to change the way the girls are judged. I think they judge, they're still ju- using a male, a male scale. A male scale. Um, that sounded weird. Um, male scale, yes. Male scale. Um, speed, power, and flow is how they judge surfing. But I don't think you should judge girls on power. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's a different body shape and a different makeup that's 
which is very obvious and can't be denied. Girls can have babies, men can't. There's, there's a different in body makeup. That's just can't be denied. You can't. You can't. Exactly. So I'd rather, I like speed. Speed's good. I think flow's really good. In fact, I think the girls have got much better flow than the men. Um, but power, you know, let's change it to something else. Let's look at grace or let's look at mm. style. Let's look at, I don't know, just something, dance, if that's a, such a thing in surfing. But you get what I'm saying. I think there there is another... It needs to be suited to the, to the physique that's doing correct. it. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I think if we could change that, um, that would help women surfing immensely and then no overlapping. But again, you're t- paying for two weeks of staffing yeah. and event site as opposed to four. Mm. Again, if the money's not there, money's not there. They should just be a little fair. And I actually think of late, they have been a lot fairer with the girls and put them out in really good conditions and then the guys have had some rubbish afterwards, and it was good. I liked it. I thought it was. I think it's great for the sport. Well, on the on the business of the sport and on the business of the WSL and some of the changes that they're now getting to implement due to uh, having a break for COVID. What's your like? I I see this as a massive business decision, and it goes back to the dopamine. I think the the fact that they're deciding they're not going to make a decision. The person who's winning. The world title won't be decided until the final heat. What do you think? Big subject. Massive, uh, massive business decision. Yeah, they just want to replicate what happened last year. Yeah. They've always wanted it. They do it with, um, they do it in basketball. They do it in football. Like the minor premier at the end of the year for NRL, for rugby league isn't the winner. They're not the premier. They're the minor premier. They yeah. won the, they won the season, but they've still got to go to the grand final. So uh, I, I kind of like it and then kind of don't like it because if you get a surfer that finishes sixth and then he's just on a heater for that event, he wins the world title from sixth. How was that? I just don't know that it can work. Not when you're talking about the entire year. So why the world tour was the world tour is because it was decided over an entire year in multiple different locations and multiple different styles of surf. You so you had to have the ability to handle the variety. Correct. So the best surf in the world is the person who can surf rip snapper to pieces, get completely kegged at Chopu, deal with Bell's unforgiving nature and and uh, marathon that Bell's is, uh, tear cloud break up if it's rippable and then get completely piped if it's barreling, go to France and deal with shifty tides and terrible beaches, do the same in Portugal, which I think they should drop one of those because they're both basically the same wave. Um, yeah. So that's the best surfer in the world, one that can deal with all those. Like I love the fact that Parco in 2012 won the title without winning an event. Yeah. Second place is all year long. He ended up winning Pipe that year, but that was after he was crowned. Yeah. So I kind of like that. I, I still think he was the best surfer for the year, whether yeah. in – you know, as opposed to someone hot and cold that wins, like goes hot, wins an event, goes cold, went, goes hot, wins yeah. an event. So this inconsistency doesn't make them the best surfer in the world. And that's what we're, that's what we're supposed to be crowning is the best surfer in the world. And a one-off event with the top, if it's six, I don't even know how many they're taking. Yeah, you know, you could have had bad curry the night before. I don't know. Fight yeah. with the misses. You could have being jet lagged and you don't deal with plane travel well, you could, it could be onshore and you're up against some person that's lightweight and can handle on like onshore conditions. So I don't think it's the best way to cite it. I think it, as you say, it's completely business driven. Um, Was I excited with the final being the last two surfers surfing the last heat, which was the final to decide the world title? No, because I'm Brazilian. I didn't care. I didn't, I didn't care. <laughs> Spoken by a true Gold Coast man. <laughs> I'm, pro- I'm, pro- 
positive. I'm not racist. I have got Brazilian friends. I think they're amazing. I had Brazilian living with me. I think they're great people. But I couldn't care if it was a couple of Americans. I couldn't care if it was a couple of South Africans. I love my Aussies because I'm an Aussie and you've got to love, you, you know, you love your fan for a reason. So for me, I just went, well, whatever. I'll watch it because it's surfing, but I wasn't invested. So, so are we going to be invested in that kind of event? I don't know. Well, so from a business perspective, how do you see that playing out then? How long do you think it'll last? Like, do you think it is a good business decision? Basically, I say it's core and for likes to get the views for that, you know, that final. But is that sustainable? Is that the right um, business strategy moving forward for the WSL? Do you follow cricket? No, I fucking hate cricket. It's so boring. Yeah, exactly. Have you heard of a game called 50 over limited cricket? Like no. day night games, 50 overs, one day, one day game. So you got, heard of that. You get, I think it's a five day is a test match. And then they went to limited Who over, which is cricket? 50 overs. All right, let, let me Only think. alcoholics can go to watch. No, cricket. exactly. And drink a river of Forex. Yeah. Then, cool. So then they went to 50, um, 50, limited over, which is 50 overs. Mm -hmm. And then they went to 2020 Big Bash because they're trying to secure a market that doesn't care. So stop trying to secure a market that doesn't care. Surfing is like watching cricket. If you love it, you'll watch it, whether there's two people bobbing up and down the water for half an hour and get one wave each or whether they're getting a wave every two minutes. You'll yeah. watch it because of the dopamine and because you love the sport and people who love it. Wasn't a Wazalewski no, hanging out and bobbing up and down. <laughs> wish I didn't have to do that. Um, they could really need to fix their commentary team. Anyway, that's another subject completely. Um, uh, you want to just in there then? Oh, I put Ock back in there because he's funny. <laughs> I put I team up Sean Doherty and Ocky because Sean gets oh. so much out of Ock. And make, it, just, it just becomes funny. Um, I would... Keep the team of Ronnie Blakey and I'd add um, Vaughn Blakey's brother. They're really good together, although you don't know who you're listening to. So it's kind of Can't like hear the difference. you're only listening to one person, even though there's two there. <laughs> so maybe you think it's bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one's got hair, one doesn't. Him. Now you like her. <laughs> um, but that's the point. People love surfing for surfing because that's what they love and they watch people bobbing up and down. If they don't watch people, don't like people bobbing up and down, they're not going to watch the six man final thing anyway. So stop trying to turn it into something else. And test cricket still survive. 2020 Big Bash struggles like one day cricket does. So it's, it's not fixable like this they're they're treating it like typical marketing people not by passionate surfers mm -hmm. um i mean to be honest uh dirks if is godsend for surfing because without his money we couldn't be doing we couldn't have a world tour um but i think they could be smarter about it i think they could do far more cost effective things um they don't have to have the hoopla that comes with when you go down snapper when the pros on it's just like so much infrastructure there that's not that necessary come on you had to have a little bit of a giggle when the corona pro got cancelled yeah of course we all when there's a giant the giant set of scaffolding and stadium seating all set up and it says corona pro and then well, you're in the water and it gets cancelled for the coronavirus well and we're not down in half a day <laughs> We're not talking about irony here, are we? We're talking about what's good for the sport. I love irony, by the way. I think it's um, but you know, do they did do they need that many people? Do they need that much infrastructure? Do they need possibly, maybe, maybe that's what it costs, maybe that's what it takes. Um, I don't know the business side of the WSL that well. In fact, I don't know it at all. Um, it's very much an outsider's perspective. Um but where were we going? <laughs> <laughs> Anything to do with the business of WSL? Bad oh, business of WSL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Making, it's, it's marketers tough. making the decisions rather oh, than. Yeah, for the, yeah. Well, that's, as I said before, that's what happened in surf industry when um, equity firms. Batman started. on golf course wearing billable. Well, no, when um, 
private equ- equity and shareholders and that got involved in it and they had to keep making a profit and it was nothing to do with um, sustainability. It was just profitability. That's why Rip Curl kind of survived as long as they did. So enjoy that book. It's an excellent book. Um, they survived because there is a time through the GFC. They didn't make a profit but they did not lay off one person. It was everyone just got their wage. Everyone made their living as they always needed to. So they just, they kept it tight, didn't worry about profit, maintained staff. And next minute you've got, you know, they come through it out the other side in flying colours. Um, I hope that Kathmandu can maintain the same sort of sentiment towards Rip Curl now that they own it, but I don't know. Mm. Well, actually, one of the articles in this episode, this episode, this yes. issue, episode, issue, yeah. okay, um, was around um, businesses surviving COVID and the industry surviving the, the changes and that and going back. And they referenced, I can't remember who, um, which contributor it was, sorry. Brad Britton. Um, oh, right. Uh, and about going back to thinking about what happened with the GFC and um, what happened in the 80s and and the businesses like Rip Curl scaling back and going, okay, well, without all the fancy shit and all the bells and whistles, what do you need to go surfing and do that well, serve that market because surfers are always going to buy what they need to go surfing. Correct. So nail that and get rid of the shit. Tech boardies, wetsuits, leggies, fins, boards, wax. And, you know, most of the kids are wearing blank gear anyway. So some person's, you know, designed a brand called Project Blank. <laughs> so they, they've jumped onto that because, you know, kids are wearing no labels anymore and that's fine. I mean, when I was growing up, I loved having a big Billabong T-shirt or a big Quicksilver T-shirt. That, was, that set me apart from the other jocks um, or cool, groovy, swampies and that's the era i grew up in um because that was your statement now no one wants to make a statement no one wants to sort of separate themselves oh, i just remembered i got my very first pair of billabong jeans from surfing line <laughs> i re- yeah. we were a little bit poor living in a trailer and i remember like i would enter every competition there you go and <clears throat> i entered a competition and, and won myself a pair of billabong jeans i thought i was the hottest shit ever of course you did <laughs> Because you were. I used, to, I used to like, I used to save up. I got my surfing life every issue. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I just think that there's, we've seen a good shift in the industry. Um, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, yeah. I'm loving where things are going, to be honest. So tip, tips for business owners. What do you reckon some of the lessons are through the last eight months um, that you could dish out? What have you seen from seeing other brands come through and survive or from what you've done yourselves? Um, What we did ourselves was we just um, identify the wasteful areas and the things that we could cover ourselves um, by just working a bit harder. What I've seen other businesses do, um, I saw a lot of knee-jerk reactions. I saw a lot of businesses doing bad things to be honest um, things that I wouldn't recommend and they just they pulled all their marketing out which is just dumb um, if you if you look at the GFC coca-cola or cola wars um, mm-hmm. through through the GFC coca-cola went oh we're, we're stopping all marketing because you know times are tough and Pepsi went yes <laughs> and and quadruple their marketing and clawed a massive percentage back from um, Coca-Cola, which they've never gotten back, and Pepsi's maintained that that portion of the market. So, um, dumbest thing you can do is to, whenever you hit any financial, uh, what do they call it? Not depression. What's the one before it? Recession. We're having it recession. So, when recessions hit, just look for waste. But marketing isn't wasteful. It's just easy. Marketing is the easy thing to slash. You go, oh. We're spending a amount every year. I can easily stop that and we don't have that bill. And they're like, yeah, but where's your business come from? Where, where are you going to get sales now? Yeah. Correct. What, correct. Do you replace, what activities are replacing that? Correct. So that's the, that's the knee-jerk reaction is to um, pull marketing budgets out. 
Um, but what, as far as uh, the surf industry businesses, um, they didn't have to do anything, to be honest. Um, the more people than ever was going surf and everyone was turning back to the board. Absolutely. That was the point. Uh, everyone, they, there was um, surfboard blank shortages. People couldn't get blanks to carve boards. They had skilled labor shortages uh, for making the boards. Uh, everyone was struggling to get their, their fins and leggies and tail pads out of China. So uh, there was a few brands that actually started making things onshore. That was a pretty smart thing. But again, cost of we've, we've priced ourselves out of the labor market when it comes to uh, any manufacturing. So it's only if it can be um, automated that we'll ever see any kind of manufacturing back in Australia. Um, that's just because you know, cost of living here and then, you know, our desire to be better. So therefore, you, you know, we expect more wages and that's cool. I want people yeah. to expect that. That's what's happened to the our manufacturing though. We, nothing can be manufactured here. Um, I think the last car company went a year ago, didn't it? There's no more cars being manufactured in Oz. Um, so as far as that goes, I didn't see much shift. Um, I thought I saw the people who, um, saw it as an opportunity to push harder into the industry or into any industry, um, like the Pepsi example, um, did really well. Mm. I saw surf travel suffer immensely because what else can you do? Um, so we've been working there was with... no Costa Rica for me in June, July. Yeah, I missed three trips this year that was supposed to happen. Yeah. But I kind of replaced them, so... Uh, working with the guys at World Safaris, we tried to help them out, but they also got us sorted with, we went to the, um, on a surf charter to the Southern Barrier Reef. We just got back a couple of weeks ago. Oh, true. Surfing reef passes on the Great Barrier Reef. It's pretty exciting. Um, so it's here. You can do it. You just got to, yeah. and they were creative and they were smart. So um, just replacing, not necessarily like for like, but with stuff that works uh, as well. Um yeah, that's that's kind of it. That's sort of just get creative, shift. Big businesses always suffer because they can't shift. Nope. It's the elephant and the mouse, you know. The mouse. Yeah. That's why the elephant is so scared of the mouse because it can't control it. And then you get that in big business as well. They try and stomp yeah. on the mouse in big business, stomp on the small business because they can't move. They can't adjust. They can't pivot. Yeah. Man, I, word, I hate buzzwords. Two thousand and twenty. Pivot. Oh my goodness. <laughs> pirouette, maybe. What's that? Pirouette. pirouette. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh, I just sidestep. <laughs> Total sidestep. Yeah. Um, I have like a million questions for you, but I know that we we really need to to keep to going wrap. if you want to. I don't mind. Oh, beautiful. Me. Okay, beautiful. So, um, I still got to be here. I've I've got one on. I, I, Okay, this is how industrious I am. I'm using my insulated, ridiculously overpriced coffee uh, plunger to keep my beer cold and even the ice is still cold in the bottom of it. Yeah, because I didn't there want to have to get go. up if it was time for another beer. Yeah. I, sh I should have done that, but mm -hmm. I'm still good. <laughs> no, I'm good. Um, so I did want to touch on um, products and sustainability. Um, hmm. And anyone that you've seen as rising stars like obviously we, we talked about no talks and yep. I, when I got my no talks, I went on a mission to find myself uh, as, as sustainable as possible deck grip. I got the, uh, the fins made from recycled or reclaimed um, fishing nets. I've got my, you know, <laughs> all my Slater design stuff all over this board. And then yeah. I got me shout out to the girls from, um, from green grip. I got myself some green grip surf wax um, made locally here on the Goldie um what what are you what have you come across who do you is it and i know with all the sponsors and stuff we've got to be a little careful for you but <laughs> I, I don't have to be careful and call things what they need to be um in surfing and the whole environmental green movement it's pretty important to understand that excuse me there's this thing called greenwashing and it's a bit it's, like me with the paper right eh? <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. That's not a, such a bad thing. Um, it was just when they went, oh, magazines are no good either, you know, and books are no good, but, you know, they live on and they can be recycled. However, um, 
Notox have doing a very good job because they're using flax as well as bioresins and stuff like that. Um, but then you'll get someone that is using flax on their boards, but they're still using fiberglass. So, and that ends up being just for the look. Um, Slater Designs, uh, love to work with those guys. I think they're doing a great job. However, they have got the algae um, tail pads. Yeah, that's what that yep. is. Yep. Sit and down. I'm going to die, aren't I? No, no, you're not going to die because they're doing the right thing in one sense. And I believe the wrong thing in another sense. So they're doing it right by using algae base because that's a renewable product, but then they're painting it so no one else can. Uh, so they need that? on the Elon Musk train. They need to have open source. Yeah, open source. Yeah, exactly. If they yep. open source that, then I would say they are honestly doing yeah. something for the environment. What do you um, think of the creatures pad? Because I was tossing up between uh, the Slater designs and the creatures for the eco pad. They're all good. I got shapers have do an eco pad as well. Um, as long as you know, can you re use recycle stuff for for your tail pads, and that's just as good. So as long as things are being recycled and renewed, then it's fantastic. Um, you know, limestone wetsuits. That's greenwashing because the amount of petrochemical it takes to dig the limestone out, and it's not a renewable product. Um, Patagonia are doing a great job with their rubber wetsuits coming from rubber trees. However, they've got a bit to go because they're not super stretchy, you know, so they're not high performance. Um, they're good enough to keep you warm, but, you know. What do you reckon I, is the best eco suit on the market at the moment? If you were to balance, like if you went performance versus sustainability. The one that lasts the longest. Yeah, so one that you don't have to, and this is why I loved my, the reason why I got the, I think it's the Ulex, uh, whatever that leg rope is. Um, because if something breaks, you can just replace that one, but you don't toss the whole thing yeah. aside. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, good, that's good tech. Um, yeah, honestly, look after your gear. Don't let it break um, and let it, you know, don't replace it just because it doesn't look pretty anymore um, is a, an, a, a, an eco way to live. But we all drive to the beach unless we live where you do. Um, but then you still have to drive to the supermarket. So <laughs> you can't have everything. You can't have the supermarket and the, at all of it in the one spot. So um, in the, it's, But we can make more conscious choices. Like yeah, even to the point, last week I have a pair of stilettos because when I'm not completely barefoot, I'm usually in heels. And I paid 25 bucks for them. They're really good shoes. They've been great. Heel went on them. The elastic went on them. I took them to the shoe man. He says $41.95 to fix them. And I was like, oh, fuck that. I'll just buy a new pair. And then I went, actually, do you know what? Fix them. Because there's nothing wrong with them besides needing the heel and a bit of elastic. And I'm going to throw out a perfectly pe good pair of shoes Crap. into landfill for the sake of, you know, and 20 bucks. Yep. Yep. That's and my boyfriend's like, you could have you could have donated that. And I was like, I did. I donated it to the planet. Wait, well, no, you donated to old mate who's earning a living. The man. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. needs to earn a living too. He needs to earn a living too. But I felt yeah. much better about making that decision and going, do you know what? That's just consumerism. I don't yep. actually need a whole nother pair of shoes. Yeah. Just because yep. they're cheap. Yeah. The same with our wetsuits. Like just because the, you know, they've gone a bit sketch across the chest. I use my older wetsuits for my mid-season. Ah, so when I'm going thinner? from, yeah, they let a bit of water in. I'm searching. This is a shout out to anyone listening. I desperately want to make my own stubby coolers for barrels and business because you know of, barrels, barrels, business and beers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, out of reclaimed wetsuits. Wetties, yeah. So if and I haven't found anywhere yet. So if anyone finds anyone does this, anyone knows somebody, please hook me up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I think buying quality so you're not replacing it quickly. I'm a big believer in um, spending 120, 150 bucks on a pair of boardies and having them for 10 years. Most of my boardies are 10 years old. Like, I don't look cool anymore and I've checked the fashion. I've gone out of fashion. Oh, you'll come uh, back around. Well, they, they're, they're that well back. made. Well, they're that well made. And they're already made out of recycled plastic. 
So the recycled stretch forties yeah. by Billabong. I'll shout them out on this one. Um, they're ten years old and they're still going great. So um, yeah, if you can buy something that's going to last, that's actually better anyway. And that's the again the the PU versus EPS argument. Uh, mm -hmm. PU surfboard, you can fix it and you can keep living. They rarely, unless they snap, and that's normally the cheap rubbish anyway. Um, they live on. I've got boards that are decades old and they're still perfectly fine. So um, admittedly, we have to you know, keep looking for um, uh, sustainable solutions. And I think the push towards sustainable solutions is fantastic. So if I was giving shout outs, it'd be to the people pushing towards it. It mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily to be to the actual product they've currently got. Yeah. Because they all leave a lot to be desired regardless yeah. so there's no you know you've got carbon miles and you've got all of this stuff so there's no there's no you know and i think giving someone a tick is kind of bad anyway because then they sort of rest on their laurels a little bit yeah um to be honest you know if we all just work from home this is one of my major things with environmentalism all right think of this one thing let's do this in australia Currently, well, through Corona, not, but just pre-Corona, pre-Corona, 50% of the infrastructure was empty 100% of the time. Houses, offices, schools, hospitals, no, but you get what I mean. So everyone would leave their home and go to work and school. Home was empty. Then they'd leave their home and school. I mean, their work and school and come home. Work and school was empty. So half of what we've got out there is empty 100% of the time. So let's, if, wow. we home, if we homeschool and home office, then imagine all that infrastructure. Imagine, so oh, I've got to build all these new roads for this traffic problem we've got to Brisbane with the M1. So all of those billions of dollars could be completely gone if employers trusted employees. If they simply did that, and they work from home and then people learn how to get along a bit better with their spouses and their kids. <laughs> that, well, that's been one of the biggest problems, right? Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Um, but you can still do it. You can still have your own space at home and you just respect each other's space if that's what you'd need. Um, like, and I get creative collaboration. That's extremely important. And, but you don't have to do that 100% of the time. You do that 20% of the time. Get together for those twenty. Yes, get so you those ten percent. That's correct. Space. Correct. So imagine the impact that would have on our infrastructure, or imagine the ease it would. How yeah. much it would ease. And you remember it was like driving around before, like during COVID. It's like there's no traffic because everyone's at home. Yeah, that's a good thing. So the so the fridge and the the fridge that's the fridge at work and fridge at home that are both running 100% of the time, being used 50% of the time. Yeah. It's the amount of the air cons that get effect. left on. and What's that? The ripple effect. Well, like just even oh, when... It wouldn't COVID be a ripple. Started, it wouldn't be a ripple. It'd be a bloody tsunami. tsunami. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, even when they, you know, you could start seeing Everest. Like you could start yeah. seeing like the, just the, and how quickly the, yeah. the visibility started showing up and things like that. It was ridiculous. The canals in Venice. Yep. The, the canals in Venice. Uh, and I was incredible. in Venice. I was in Venice uh, in June, July last year to, that would have just been incredible. Incredible to see. Yeah. We've loved it. But you wouldn't have been able to see it because you, you know, can't well, fly there. And you no, couldn't, can't fly there. You would um, have to walk to see them and you only get to see a little bit and blah, blah, yeah. blah. So. But even like I'm on a war against uh, single use coffee cups. <laughs> Yep. Uh, and the, here's the, the here's the rub here. The plastic thing on top is more recyclable than the than the paper cup than the waxed. Well, it's a wax cup, and that's the issue. Underneath. Yeah. Well, it's also because it's had food in it and dairy in it. So once that, and if you throw that cup with a little bit of milk in with the other rest of the recycling, you've just contaminated the whole rest of the recycling. I see. I think that's rubbish. Anyway, I think they could decontaminate that that very quickly. You reckon? Yeah, it's laziness. I just think that it's we it's it's I'm all about minimizing the use. So if you don't need it, don't use it. So if you go to the shop 
and you don't need a lid, don't get the lid. Couldn't like, agree more. Because there's still the whole manufacturing process involved and, with that. And the carbon miles on that. The carbon miles, the delivery, like everything that goes into being able yeah. to have a lid. If you Absolutely. don't need the lid, don't take the lid. So Correct. even I have a whole thing where if I don't have my... Uh, ruins a cappuccino anyway. That lid ruins it. <laughs> Suck it I, uh, in the hole. Ugh. <laughs> If I don't have my keep cup, I don't have a coffee. If I don't have my juice cup, I don't have a juice. Like that's just a hard rule. Yeah, but through Corona, you weren't allowed to use your keep cup. Yeah, but if you if you bought like the coffee, I could have no lid, and yeah. you could tip it, I could tip it into my keep cup. Usually, I have a long black, so normally they double sleeve the long black. Yeah. So you then I I could just have one single. Yeah. So I just like I can just grab it by the top and tip it, or the places that we're not making you have takeaway cups. I would have a take in yeah. so have a mug. And I did this just recently. Um, like literally there's a few places still wouldn't take the keep cup. Yep. And so I'm like, okay, just give me a mug. And I asked them for, for a saucer and I just tipped it. Yeah, exactly. Take your own cup in, tip it in, give it back yep. to them. I have my yeah, own coconut works. bowl that I use for Asahi. I take my yeah. own cutlery. Right. And it's just about having that value of, hmm. I, I don't need a coffee that bad that if I, no, nah. And I tell you what, you stop forgetting your cup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, it's like going to the shopping center without your bag now, isn't it? Yeah. You just so, wheel a wheel a trolley out and dump all the dump it all in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Done that plenty of times. <laughs> I, I've got this poor bag that I got. My sister got me from Bali, like this, um, like a beach bag, and made out of basically weeds. And it's now just falling apart at the seams because that was my shopping bag. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that happens, eh? Uh, um, I want to ask you just one last thing. Um, in terms of mastery, tell me what mastery is to you and why it's important to a business owner. Uh, I've never really been into the whole mastery thing. Um, I, I think... I think passion and effort equals mastery. So maybe I am, but I just think if you're, if you can be passionate and it doesn't even mean, doesn't even need to be like, Oh, I'm passionate about surfing. So it's easy for me to be passionate about surfing life. Now I've done plenty of jobs. Like I said, um, working with bidets. So I, I was passionate about producing a really good product or a really good campaign for those guys. So that passion plus a lot of hard work can do whatever you want. You can be a master of anything. So um, I, I see mastery as being a, a, a master at something. So um, I think if you just give it, give everything to something and with, with all your passion and all your brain and all your whatever you got, then you're a master. So you don't even, it doesn't have to be anything more than that for my, in my mind. Did that do make you, sense? It does. Do do you have any habits, behaviors, or routines that you are regimented with, or that you've found that you have developed over the years to to make you? Because you you're pretty high performing. You're doing some pretty cool things. Oh, uh, never get ADHD diagnosed. <laughs> it's something wrong with that. No, ADHD is like to me. That's people want. Oh, I want the pill to give me all of this energy and life. I'm like, well, first thing, don't get your kids diagnosed because you'll, you'll then give them that pill of, of just crazy effort and skill. Obsessive compulsiveness is, um, is also on the spectrum. And I think it's an amazing thing. I, I love people who are obsessive compulsive. It oh, might, thank you. It <laughs> might, yeah. Um, we're going to get, my wife and I always talk about getting a shirt printed. It says Club OC. It's the drive that defines us. <laughs> I love so, it. I had a I had a doctor tell me that I had a cracking case of ADHD. And I looked at him like, oh, and he goes, Don't worry, you wouldn't have been able to do all the things that you've done otherwise. No, ADHD is a weapon. I love it. Um I, you know, guys like um Einstein would have been completely written off in today's society, and that would have been a travesty. So I think if you're worried that your kids that way, don't be worried, just point them in the right direction and go, Hey, you're focused, be focused on this. What do you want to be focused on? 
it doesn't even matter if they want to be focused on Lego or video games because bloody hell, you can make a fortune. You can make a ton of money out of that. <laughs> you can make it out of anything. You make money out of anything. So passion and drive and just going for it um, gives people those abilities. Uh, as far as what do I do to keep me going, uh, I have to shift a lot because I don't have that um, – attention not attention span i kind of do but like on on a day daily working for me i'll get stuck into one thing and then i'll feel myself fade out of that space so i go right i want to move on to this thing so i don't have to finish anything completely on that day for that thing now um some people do and go with what you have to do so i'll go i'll get up and i'll I'll go hang a load of washing out or I'll make a phone call to a client or I'll answer a different email or I'll just sit down and do email or I'll just go on to editing photos or I'll, I'll just keep shifting. And then you're doing a lot of things at once, all of them well, because you're applying yourself hundred percent at that time. You can't do two things at the same time, but you do one thing and then you shift onto another thing and then shift onto another thing. So that's more, you know, mastery for someone who's got a not a short attention span because I don't think that's true either because I can still sit down and binge 13 hours of some TV show without <laughs> any problem. Oh, come on then. What's your latest binge session? Uh, actually, Queen's Gambit was really good. What the hell is that? Yeah, it's a, a woman who um, is orphaned at a really young age and then becomes a, a chess prodigy. So it's about chess and I hate chess. I've never played it, so... But it was an amazing show. So, um, the Queen's Gambit. Yeah, on uh, Stan. So. I, don't, I barely got Netflix. I don't, <laughs> have an aerial, I don't have an aerial that plugs into my television. I only have a television. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we haven't had free to air for five years, but now you can get it through your fetch box. So, but I still don't watch it. Um, but yeah, just doing that, I think, just, you know, keep, keep working hard, getting everything right. Don't worry about something to be perfect before you start it. Start it imperfect because it's never perfect anyway because if you think you get it perfect, technology and time shift so quickly that then your perfectness is out of date. So it's imperfect again. So forget perfect. Perfect is actually should be taken out of the English language because there is no such thing as perfect. It's, I like that. It's, it's an impossible goal. Perfection is bullshit. I, I always I always clutch onto progress is better than perfection. <laughs> like trying to clutch. No, onto- just yeah, just do stuff. Just get it done. Move on to the next thing. Just do shit. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just like even if I do, if it's not perfect, it's still better than nothing. Better than nothing. Yeah, better than doing nothing until you're waiting till it's just as you want it. No, nah, just get it out there. Fix it, fix it, fix it. Because even if you get it like you think is perfect, by the time you've got it to out to the public or whatever, you're still going to be unhappy with it because you've grown and evolved as you've a person. You've evolved past well, it. <laughs> correct. So just get it out there. Awesome. So, yeah. Beautiful. And if you could leave the listeners with one parting thing, is there where would you like to direct them to hang out with you more and what's one parting sentiment you'd like to, to leave us all with? Hang out with me more. Come for a surf. You can find me in the water from between Burley and Valley. Fingal. No, no. I scam wherever. Wherever it's good and there's no people, that's where you find me. It's hard to hang out with me because I go and surf where there's no people. <laughs> um, uh, go and read books. It's good for you. It's good for the brain. Um, whatever you want to do, just do it. Don't worry about what the naysayers say because... There's always going to be naysayers no matter what. Um, and don't fake it till you make it. I think fake it till you make it's bullshit. Just go and do stuff. That's not faking it because you're actually doing it. Because you're Just doing it. Go and do it. It's not faking it. It's like I might not be on the – it's like with surfing. Surfing is a really good example. You go, oh, I'm, I'm not that good a surfer. And I'm like, well, compared to me, my daughter's not very good. Compared to Kelly, I'm not very good. Who are we comparing? Stop comparing yourself with people. Compare yourself with yourself. Tomorrow be better than what you were yesterday. If you can do that, you'll continue to achieve. There's a bit of mastery, I guess, for you. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. I love that one. Yeah, just always be better than you were. Correct. Yeah. 
if you're better yesterday, a better tomorrow than you were yesterday, you're going to be on a trajectory that takes you where you need to go. I love that. That's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so so very much. Um, Guys, if you do want to buy some books though, surfinglife.com.au or just consume a little bit more of Ray. What about, where's these 20,000 bloody Instagram followers hanging out at? Uh, Ray Bishop. Okay. Any sponsors that want to throw Ray a piece of product or something? (laughs) He's got enough. Got enough more space on his board. I can't take it. It's too much conflict of interest with my advertisers. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I'll throw, throw a few my way then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll take a beer sponsor or two. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I'm, cha- I'm going to chase. Um, you get it. Yeah, just because I, only because I want to get the message out about them. Because <laughs> I'm I like anti-sugar and preservatives. I'm on a war against sugar and preservatives. So. No, I think, I think sugar's fine. No, stop it. Yeah. Get off. Goodbye. Join it. Join it. Join it. Join it. Let me tell you what I tell my kids real quick. Delete. <laughs> Delete. I say sugar's good for you. Lollies are good for you. Chips are good for you. Carrots are good for you. Lettuce is good for you. Chicken's good for you. Fish is good for you. Lollies are bad for you. Chips are bad for you. Sugar's <laughs> bad for you. Carrots are bad for you. Lettuce is bad for you. Chicken's bad for you. Fish is bad for you. Everything is good for you. Everything is bad for you. If you only eat carrot, you will turn orange. If you only eat fish, you will have a lacking part of your diet. If you only eat lollies, you'll get sick and fat and terrible things will happen to you. Excess is the, is the abomination. Balance is the key to it all. Oh, I think that can be applied to everything, can it? Absolutely everything. So say that again. I want my team to get this as a quote. Excess is the... Excess is an abomination. Balance is the key to everything. Love it. I'm going to end on that note. Yeah, another, another Ray quote for you. I love it. Give us a cheers. Have you still got a beer? Chin, chin. Chin, chin. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in, guys. As always, if you've got any value or any laughter out of this episode whatsoever, please drop us a comment or share it with a friend that you think could learn something from this man, Ray Bishop. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Hey there, Barrel Chasing business owners. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the show. What I would love for you to do if you feel like you got any value or entertainment out of this episode at all is to leave us a five-star review and comment below so that we can share the message and impact as many business owners like you as possible. Thanks.